paper and then have a discussion. And I see that recording has started. Okay, and I think it's it's time to open this session. So uh, welcome everybody um, to this session on tools and environments one. And uh, yeah, I'm happy that we have uh, six presentations and we will go through all of these presentations first. So each presentation is supposed to run about five minutes. And then we have a concluding discussion of 30 minutes uh, on all the papers. And uh, yeah, everybody is uh, heavily invited to participate in this discussion. But first, we need some food for the discussion. So I will hand over to the first talk in this session, which is given by Yai Kanan. And the title of the paper is ML Smellhound, the Context Aware Code Analysis Tool. So uh, Yai, the stage is yours. Please. Yep. Thank you, Tima. Uh, am I saying your name correct? Hopefully, I didn't butcher it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jack Cannon, and I'll be presenting my paper, ML Smellhound, a Context Aware Code Analysis Tool. The benefits of code analysis are well known, and machine learning code stands to benefit from code analysis tools. In my research, I'm studying the applicability of code analysis tools to machine learning code. Uh, code analysis tools applied to machine learning code suffer from false positive rights. The definitions of false positives are thrown to subjectivity, influenced by the programming language and the developer's perception. To balance the problem of false positives, tools need to be calibrated using configurations. Choosing the correct configuration to analyze code is also challenging as incorrect configuration leads to permissibility of defects. In our research, we hypothesize that the inclusion of context can improve the identification of defects via the reduction of false positives. We conceptualize context as features related to the problem domain, the purpose of the code, the life cycle of the code, the environment the code is developed in, and other factors that influence the output of code analysis tools. To further understand the concept of context, we uh, take, a, uh, take a, code, uh, a piece of code taken from an open source machine learning project. We believe that considering the characteristics of code is an important factor during code analysis. The code on the right, we see the use of single letter variable names and as well as the mathematical nature of the code highlighted in red boxes. In mathematics, single capital letter variable names are used to represent matrices. Furthermore, the code is also implemented similar to the mathematical counterpart. In our research, we want to investigate if considering these characteristics of code as context can improve the results provided by code analysis tools. We also want to investigate if context can be better used to understand and identify machine learning code smells. To test our hypothesis, we implemented a prototype of our tool using PyLint. Our approach uses a context meta model to identify the type of code and determine what context to apply. A set of context transformations are also applied that changes uh, the rules and configurations of the linter. And finally, context checkers checks for ML smells and generate, uh, generates a contextualized output for the end user. In our prototype, we implemented co uh, the context meta model using the problem domain. We use the problem domain to check the file level imports. Based on the imports, we determine if an incoming file is a machine learning file or a non-machine learning code file. We then apply context transformations, which selectively uh, apply and disapply pilot rules to analyze the code. The transformations include addition, where we've added certain custom rules, subtraction that disables certain rules on the code, remessage, where we've reworded pilot output for understandability, and reprioritize, which re-ranks certain rules. We use a context checker that checks the code for code spells, and based on the rules, it generates a contextualized output for the end user. For our initial evaluation, we analyze, uh, uh, we analyze a block of machine learning code using PyLint in the default configurations. We see that the variable name DF is picked up as a violation. In, in machine learning programming, DF is a common acronym used for a data frame. Next, we apply context to PyLint and analyze the same piece of code. We see that this is no longer as a violation when the new rule set is applied. Now, moving forward with our research, we plan our research in three phases. 
in phase one, we conduct a systematic mapping study where we map uh, where we want to map existing code spells to known machine learning faults. Second, we conduct a qualitative study where we interview practitioners to identify what is the relevant context and what are the code, uh, relevant code smells that are valued during machine learning development. Using the findings from phase one, we refine the definition of context to create the context models. We then apply the context models to annotate machine learning code and code smells. We do this process iteratively while evaluating if context is useful in improving the precision of um, code analysis tools. Moving forward in phase three, we implement a full version of our tool and evaluate if context is effective in reducing false positives in a controlled study with practitioners. Thank you for listening. And I'm Jay Cannon once again, uh, my details are on the screen and thank you for listening. Thank you, Jai. So this was a presentation from the new ideas and emerging results track, yep. actually, which you learned from uh, the style of the presentation. So there is a, a, a sophisticated plan of what you want to do in the future. And as I said, discussion about this will be later on. So we will switch to the, to the next uh, talk. And we will now have actually some talks um, a couple of talks from the software engineering in practice uh, track. And um, the next one is given by Hyunjin Kim. So Hyunjin, <clears throat> could you please start uh, to share your screen? And while you're doing this, uh, I will let you know about the title. So it's a unified code review automation for large scale industry with diverse development environments and this research has been conducted within Samsung Research and Samsung Electronics. As I said, talk is given by Hyunjin Kim. So Hyunjin, please, the stage is yours. Nice to meet you. This is a short paper talk titled Unified Code Review Automation for Large Scale Industry with Diverse Development Environment. I'm Hyunjin Kim a software engineer in Samsung, Elec Samsung Electronics, Samsung Research. I'd like to share my experience on applying code review automation to Samsung Electronics. Code review automation is, as you know, a process of generating code reviews, which are from the result of predefined set of tools. When performs code review automation, it reduces human efforts in code quality assurance, and the automation may have rapid code review. So it takes an important role in modern code review activities. However, in fact, there are so many hurdles for adopting code review automation in a real world industry area. Let me introduce examples in Samsung Electronics. Samsung Electronics manufactures many kinds of products, as you know, Mobile phones named Galaxy Series is the representative product. Also, these items are also the product of Samsung Electronics. Not only the various uh, products, but also the size of each software are getting larger and larger. Naturally, Libby requests contain a large size of code changes. These environments make big hurdles to code review automation, as I said. To manage these huge size codes in Samsung Electronics, products adopt their own source code management systems, Git and Purpose Helix Core, and code review systems, GitHub Enterprise Edition, Gary, and Helix Swarm. In addition, there are number of numbers of development teams in Samsung Electronics, so they have their own own development processes and cultures, such as their own quality assurance policies and various energy tools. Because of the huge size code changes and various cultures, a code review automation system requires several important quality attributes. First, extensibility. Second is scalability. And the last one is performance. 
we developed an automatic code review system called Code Review Bot for code review automation to take root. Take root. Code Review Bot can address various analysis tools and code review systems. As I said, developers in Samsung Electronics use these three re code review systems. And the code review bot supports all of them. It is based on an abstract module for review system to consider extensibility attribute, as I mentioned before. Also, we wanted to invoke, uh, invoke and schedule analysis services. So we designed the task worker module to consider the second attribute, scalability. Also, uh, to parallel processing to run services to improve performance, the rest attribute. Code review bot supports diverse analysis services. As simple services, a check spell, another name is typo, and commit size services. Also, potential defect services which find various critical defects or code smells in the cha code changes is one of the important services. Besides, code review provides coding style service, test coverage service, ground level services, and some more in-house services, and we develop new and advanced services continuously. Code Review Bot is successfully deployed to whole de deployment, eh, development teams. During a single month, August 2021, the huge size of review requests are requested to Code Review Bot, and more than 60% of detected items from potential defect service and check spell services of code review bot are really fixed and merged into real world product codes in Samsung Electronics. By developing and operating code review bot in Samsung Electronics, we provide developers with lots of insight to improve their code quality. In the future, we'll take We'll make more activities and applications to produce much more outcome. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot for the presentation, Hyun Jin. Um, so we go on to the next presentation, also a paper from the software engineering practice track. And if I see it correctly, then it's a Munich co-production of Fortis, the LMU, and Siemens. Um, and the talk is given by Markus Foggenreiter, and it's on using a semantic knowledge base to improve the management of security reports in industrial DevOps projects. So, Markus, please. Thanks a lot. Yeah, actually, you're not too far away. Um, it's actually really a Munich co-production on that, so um, got it exactly right. Um, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for joining in on the virtual presentation of this paper. Um, as we only have five minutes, we uh, try to focus on only three questions. So um, why do we need that? Um, how did we try to solve it? And what do we do with that now? And of course, we start with the question of why do we even need such a thing as a semantic knowledge base um, for this area? As a little background, we started here um, by looking into the topic of security automation. So how could we automate security activities um, in a given DevOps pipeline, in given development teams. Um, and we noticed that automating um, the entire activities, all of these activities is one part, but a crucial step here is also how do the information get back to our developers, to the project teams. And um, this was rather a challenge um, to us. So we, we had a look ourselves and tried out some tools, some existing methodologies and noticed they are not sufficient for our use case. Um, so 
we had a look ourselves into the um, problems that are there. And the first issue you will always encounter are the reports themselves from the security activities. So we had heard it in a talk before um, on machine learning and code analysis there. False positives is something you always have. And they are actually a major challenge in security as well. Um, but also, for example, different formats, different perspectives. So depending on whether you check the code or running application or monitor something, you will get completely different data. Um, furthermore, you also have the problem of utilization. So depending on your role in the project, you will need different information from these reports. So a developer is interested in how to fix things or how to prevent things. Um, a project manager more interested in how does that affect our planning, um, customer, how is the product affected and so on. So uh, what do we do with the data basically? And finally, also you have in particular in larger enterprises um, an interconnection between sources. So it's not only about um, having the data, but also adding additional information like experts opinion, uh, threat modeling, vulnerability monitoring and so on. Um, and this is manually just not possible. So uh, let's have a look into the how and how we try to address it. Um, after some research, we encountered knowledge bases, which are broadly used in, in different areas and uh, noticed, well, in security, not directly in our area. So we tried it out and uh, we set up a proof of concept using a data storage with some belief and some rules, a logical core, an inference engine and a user interface, which basically infers new knowledge each time new information is added or deleted. So for specification wise, um, we focused on revisable belief as with false positives, you sometimes have this, this information you need to revise again. Um, and that must be also represented here. And we need to ensure that the uh, knowledge itself in it is still consistent. So the information deducted from it can still be used for the project team. And of course, each knowledge base is customized to the respective projects. Um, we, we tried that out as well. And we noticed that um, when we started writing some inferences, most of them are streamlined. So you start with a parser, you do some deduplication between different tools, um, you enrich the data, for example, by external information, you validate it to identify false positive, do some prioritization, and so on. And um, with that, we also we yeah, had some experiences. We tested it currently in, in, or still test it in multiple industrial software development projects, which actually use uh, DevOps techniques and also to a certain degree in the development part, um, agile technologies. And we noticed that it's actually a big advantage in terms of effort and uh, transparency for the project team, because you have everything in one place and you can work on that one place, which is, um, yeah, it, it, it feels useful to the project team. Um, on the other hand, you, however, also have a couple of challenges. Um, we noticed when we tried it out that its usability highly depends on the interface towards our users. Um, so a good interface, which encourages the users to work with it, um, benefits um, really strongly to, to the entire process being beneficial because it depends on whether the our developers and our project um, also interact with the system. Um, on the other hand, we need to be aware that the server where all these critical security information is stored um, has a certain amount of effort to set it up and secure and harden it. And it also has some cost um, to, to, to run that, um, which are definitely some challenges we would need to look into. Um, exactly. As it's just five minutes, that's basically it already. Um, if you have some questions, feel free to ask them right now or um, reach out to me, send me an email, um, or of course, have a look into the short paper itself. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, Markus. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just one minor questions are not asked right now, but in 50 minutes. So keep them and ask Markus anything you want in 15 minutes. Um, yeah, meanwhile, we will go on with the next SAP uh, paper on uh, with a question, what's bothering developers in, in code review? Um, and this is a talk that is a, a Swedish co-production, actually, not a Munich co-production. And the talk will be given by Emma Söderberg. Um, so please, Emma, go ahead. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Yes, indeed, it's very much um, 
many authors from Sweden here, many from Lund University in different parts of this university that has many different faculties. Uh, so, and it's also this interdisciplinary uh, group and study. Uh, also, we have Luke, who's also from Cambridge. So, um, the setting here is code review, as the title says. Um, so, I'll briefly kind of get you into the mindset of code review. So, imagine that we have a couple of actors, author Alice and reviewer Root. Uh, you can imagine something like this, where uh, author Alice, she's hacking away on some kind of feature. She throws it out when she's ready for a review. She picks a reviewer, Root, and Root on the other side gets some kind of notification, looks at the code add some comments, perhaps, and then uh, that goes back to Alice, and they keep going back and forth like this, and they have a discussion. They get to a point where Root says, OK, good, uh, looks good to me, approve. Uh, and then on the other side, Alice sees that and then merges the change or submits or something like that, depending on the system. This is this is the way it can go, but many times other things happen in code review. Uh, for instance, Alice may be sitting there wondering what's going on because Root isn't saying anything. So maybe Root is on vacation, Root is very busy, or, or something else is going on. Or, um, you know, not or, at the same time, if Root is looking at the code, there are a lot of questions that Root needs answers to. So there's a change. Why this change? What's going on here? Why is this happening? What's the effect of doing this? Um, so it's a complicated activity that takes a lot of time. And many times there's not only Root, there's also maybe Rob or even, even more people involved in this review. So it's, it becomes a group activity. Uh, and so altogether, this activity is it's quite interesting. A lot of people meet in the space. It's in the center of development at, at many companies. And it, it sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't work as well. So there are conflicts and things that need to re be resolved. So um, in this, in this uh, interdisciplinary project, we were interested in kind of considering this activity uh, we focus on things that are perceived as challenges, what's bothering developers in code review. And with the idea that we are looking to sort of understand this activity more with the focus on kind of potential interventions, we could make new kinds of tools that could assist developers to in improve the developer experience here. Uh, and it's it's explorative at this, uh, at this stage. <clears throat> so what we did is we conducted 12 interviews at two multinational companies. And uh, what we report on in this short paper is uh, sort of the initial reading emerging themes uh, from these interviews. We then have sort of a follow-up survey in, in a larger mixed method study. And the complete study is, is being reported uh, at ease in June. So what's bothering developers in code review? And I'll give kind of a highlight of what we found at this stage in this study. And sort of the main thing that stood out to us from, from reading the transcripts and so on is that we saw that developers were taking on different roles in the review, uh, specifically focusing more on the reviewer side here. But the reviewers were taking on different roles, and this was uh, happening implicitly. So, for instance, uh, we had one, here's one quote from a software developer. The number one thing which we check for is, are they following the coding convention? Number two is, for example, if that makes sense, what he, she has written. So, uh, here's a developer looking at coding conventions and also the motivation of the change. At the same time, um, we had another developer uh, among our participants here, a software architect, more senior. Um, who had this perspective. I try not to go into too much detail when I code review because I assume that the code there actually works and that the tests are written and so on. Uh, of course, I can see it in the review as well. So I mainly focus on making sure nothing has been removed and that information that would be received by the API is still there. So this is an architect that has a strong connection to a certain API. So what we found interesting here is that these, these two developers potentially on the same change, they have different units of attention. So we have the first developer looking at, if we simplify a little bit, coding conventions, and we have the second uh, developer looking at API compliance, assuming a lot of things about the quality of the change already when looking at it. So different units of attention is what we are referring to here uh, to sort of describe this. Uh, but at the same time, so they have, they're in different spots with different questions, but they are getting the same presentation in this code review tool, whether it's GitHub, Garrett, or, or GitLab or something else. We didn't have anyone using Fabricator specifically in our, uh, among our participants here. So, and we refer to that as the same unit of analysis. So we think this is interesting to sort of think about, well, these different use cases, if you will, uh, need to kind of work with one presentation. Um, and that seems like there's a potential issue here. So here's, an, here's one quote from, and we had many of these uh, popping out of our data. Uh, if what happens when this, this, there is a mismatch here? 
So this is from another software developer. If it is a very complex change or a change that I'm not very familiar with, then I usually check out the commit and then I have a look at it in my IDE where I have a better syntax highlighting and can follow code more easily. And specifically follow code and kind of seeing things in different, uh, with different highlighting or something like that, that came, came up many times. It's not something we had any assumptions about beforehand. It was sort of unexpected. Uh, so this became a quite, quite a strong sort of emerging theme here. So we see this as an indication that there is a mismatch here. This is a costly thing to do. So taking typically to take it out of the code review tool over here into my ID over here and get sort of things hooked up. So uh, we see it as a mismatch and um, altogether um, at this stage, we, we sort of see that there's this mismatch and it sort of suggests that one size does not fit all developers for this, uh, this code review task. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emma, for these insights, <clears throat> which we can discuss later. Um, but we have to go over to the next talk. And this is the last one from the software engineering practice track. Um, <clears throat> this one is on project smells, experiences in, anal in analyzing the software quality of machine learning projects with ML Lint. And uh, yes, it is given by Bart van Oort. And uh, Bart? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, I will. Um, so I'll be using the same slides as in the, uh, uh, the the presentation video. So I'm going to go through it four times as quickly. So if I'm going a bit too fast, um, yeah, let me know, obviously. Um, right. So um, this is uh, my presentation on the paper on project smells, some experiences in analyzing the software quality of ML projects with the MLint tool. Um, I'm uh, Bart, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I was doing this uh, for my master thesis at TU Delft. Um, and we, I was doing that in collaboration with the ING AI for FinTech Research Lab, ING, the uh, large Dutch uh, and uh, international global bank. Um, my uh, research was on uh, code smells and software quality and machine learning projects. And it's gonna come back in a bit. Um, so as we know, machine learning is used everywhere from anything from Google searches and financial risk assessment to dancing robots and, and whatnot. But machine learning is not magic. It still needs to be, it still is code and data, the combination of that, that needs to be written and gathered. And those people that do that are data scientists, um, most, uh, uh, most usually. Um, and mathematically, they are very strong, but they don't have a software engineering background. So they're not very experienced with writing uh, complex software systems like, um, like software engineers generally do. Um, and productionizing uh, code, even just um, a traditional software engine, a traditional software that doesn't use machine learning code, um, productionizing that is already quite difficult. Uh, there's a bunch of challenges um, with that, but especially in machine learning, that is extra difficult because you have these extra challenges of um, data dependencies, uh, a model. Um, you need to deploy that in some way. It needs to be monitored. Um, there's a, a drift detection. Um, loads of different um, uh, caveats, so to speak. Um, but in traditional software engineering, we have developed a whole a host of tools that that can help us with that. We've got Git for version control, Kubernetes for handling deployments, um, testing frameworks, static analysis tools to help us with uh, finding code smells. Um, but um uh, code smells specifically code smells are only a small piece of the software quality puzzle and we noticed that um last year at uh wayne 21 where we um produced a paper published a paper on the prevalence of code smells in machine learning projects open source machine learning projects and what we mainly found in that paper besides a list of the um most prevalent code smells in those projects um was that first of all there were bad dependency management practices um you couldn't just pip install it uh, there, there you needed to change the requirements file and that was a hassle and it uh, hurts the reproducibility of these projects um but we also noticed that there was low static analysis tool adoption people weren't really using linters that much or at all maybe um and so i came up so i decided or came up or uh, was inspired um with the idea of project smells, um, which is basically, if we take code smells being um, uh, smelly parts of the code, if 
things that could be improved, deficits in, uh, in the code. Uh, then project smells is um, uh, concerned with the deficits in how an, uh, a machine learning project is, is managed. So it's a more holistic perspective on uh, the software quality of this machine learning project. Um, I wanted to also have a practical impact to my uh, master thesis. Um, so I wanted to develop a tool that could help to improve the software quality of machine learning projects by um, detecting and mitigating, helping to detect and mitigate these uh, project smells. Um, so I oriented myself based on the um, machine learning project best practices from SE4ML uh, and Google's rules for machine learning. Um, and I created MLint. Now, MLint is a command line utility to evaluate the technological quality um, of machine learning and AI projects that are written in Python. And it does so by analyzing the project source code, the data that is uh, um, uh, linked in the repository and the configuration that is uh, available in the repository of the supporting tools that are being used. Um, for MLint, I wanted it to be useful for um, both data scientists and ML engineers to help them create and maintain production grade machine learning and AI projects. Also wanted them, um, um, ML practitioners that aren't really experienced with these te techniques to be able to use it, as well as for project managers um, to help them figure out what they can improve about their projects. Um, MLint has a number of challenges, and um, the first one being that mapping to high level best practice, mapping um, from high level best practices from SE4ML to practical guidelines is not very easy. Um, and um, to tackle this problem, we used input from uh, within ING, from um, uh, looking around in the industry. Um, but the, also, the next thing is also that um, ML projects um, are very heterogeneous. The, uh, there, there may be one project that uses um, a TensorFlow, there may be another project that uses PyTorch or some other framework. Um, there's a difference in that, but there's also a difference in the maturity of the project, so how um, uh, uh, is it a proof of concept project? Is it just being developed or is it going into production tomorrow? Um, this is still kind of an open challenge, I must say, uh, though we have uh, um, um, tackled it in, in, in some way, shape or form by making the tool configurable and allowing for custom rules. Um, the paper was mainly about evaluating MLint and their project smells and seeing how they fit within the industrial context of a large software um, of uh, ING. Um, and what differences people find with, the, with proof of concept and production ready projects, um, as well as what is stopping people from implementing best practices and what benefits do people see in using tools such as MLint. Um, we had a two part methodology here. Um, on the one hand, we uh, analyzed uh, MLint reports of eight machine learning applications within ING. Um, and uh, we also ran a survey with 22 participants. So the, um, as for the results, there is, we found three themes. Um, on data version control, we noticed that uh, no projects were using DVC. I must say DVC here refers to the specific tool DVC. Um, there were various ways in which people were version controlling their data and in, or, or managing their data. And these each have varying degrees of version control, but we noticed that there's really a lack of a standardized tooling for dealing, dealing with these data dependencies. Um, and also on the dependency management side, we kind of noticed this as well, even though it was uh, perceived to be very important to, um, uh, to uh, uh, absolutely essential for produ production ready projects. Um, the practices still differ quite a lot between the people and projects. And um, there also, we noticed that Python has a, uh, doesn't really have a standardized, easy to use and maintainable method for managing code dependencies. As for static analysis tool adoption, um, we noticed there's a tendency against the usage in the development phase, but they do kind of like use it as an after the fact quality check in the productionization phase. Um, again, we notice here that the, uh, the obstacles towards implementing or towards the use of static analysis tools is false positives, as Jay mentioned uh, before in this talk or in this uh, uh, session, um, and that the configuration um, also to mitigate these false positives is quite difficult. And uh, so we need, um, so we identify a need for context-aware static analysis tools, tools that can um, know 
what the maturity of a project is, what kind of uh, tools they use. Um, so in conclusion, um, we've seen, um, uh, I've introduced the, the concept of project smells, um, but I think that it could use with a formal definition and I think we can also, uh, uh, it would also be interesting to look at the observable impact on software quality rather than the perceived impact on software quality as this paper has um, looked at. Um, and uh, we've also looked at ML and there's a bunch more stuff that we could do, including like ML specific code, how, uh, code smells, which, um, might be interesting for um, ML smell hound. Um, Bert, yeah. you should wrap up quickly. Yes, that was basically my last sentence. So uh, that was good, so good timing, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Um, yes. I think we can talk about these relations to the to the first talk uh, later on. Uh, but uh, now we should we're a bit behind the schedule, so we should quickly switch over to the last talk of this session, which is from the XC technical track. And uh, yeah, it's on uh, laboratory control test flakiness impact assessments. And uh, the talk is given by Renault Romelika. And uh, Renault, so you have the honor to have the last talk, please. Thanks for the introduction, Timo, and very nice pronunciation of my name. <laughs> it's very rare. So uh, here I will present the paper Flakimi. That is, uh, it's a tool that is actually allowing uh, researchers to conduct laboratory control on uh, test flakiness impact assessment. So before going to the heart of the presentation, I will start by uh, defining briefly what test flakiness is. So if you see on the slide, you have an example of a test that is checking if it's the morning. So if it's the morning, it will uh, it should return morning. Uh, that's, that test will work in the morning because it will be the morning. But if, we, if you run it in the afternoon, it's not the morning. And so the test will fail. And so here you have the definition of flakiness is that under the same test and the same uh, code on the test, you have two, two different outcome of the test. So obviously this test is a very bad uh, test to write in your production code, but it's a very good example to define what test flakiness is. So the question is, uh, what is uh, the impact that uh, those tests have on software engineering techniques? So for instance- Sorry, yes? Reno? Yes? I don't know if it's just me, but I still see the structure mode of the presentation and not the slides. I don't see the slide. Yeah. Right. Uh, we see the slides, but we, we see them in present, not in the presentation mode, but uh, in editing okay. mode. So that's my uh, test. Okay, but do you see it like that? It's changing. We, we, we can see the slides. It's okay. I will, it, I will do it like it's that. Defined. It's okay. So we don't waste yeah. too much time. You will just not have the animations then. So basically, uh, for the problem, you have uh, you have different uh, software engineering techniques that have different uh, type of uh, of impact on them. So if we take mutation testing, for instance, in mutation testing, uh, when you have flaky tests, so tests that fail but should not, then the mutation score will be increased because more mutants will be killed artificially. In automatic program repair, on the contrary, uh, valid patches will be discarded because the test the tests that are covering those patches will actually fail and then uh, regard those patches as uh, as not valid. And finally, in fault localization, uh, if you use spectrum based, so you are checking uh, where the tests are failing and the coverage, if a random tests start to fail, then uh, your, your, um, your score will uh, annotate uh, part of your code everywhere. So this is a problem, as you can see, that is very pro uh, technique specific, but have a very different impact. So now the question is, how can we measure the impact that flakiness has on different methods, especially when you come up with a new technique? Because uh, uh, as I was saying, it's a very random process, test flakiness. And so it's really hard to measure the impact. So to help the developer for, to assess uh, for this, that impact, we created the tool Flakimi that will actually inject flakiness in uh, the test suite. So basically you start with a test, test suite that is uh, green, so all the tests uh, have to pass. Then we will uh, propose, um, you define a model. So we propose a few, but you can define your own model. So basically for each type of, for each test, you will uh, uh, give it a proportion, propension to, to flake, so to, to randomly fail. And then you will, we will instrument the code. And then the researcher has the opportunity to actually control the degree of flakiness, what we call the nominal flake rate. So 
how often a test will flake. So how often a test will fail for a, a random reason that is producing a false alarm. So you see here, as I go up, there is more and more flaky tests. And then you have the test outputs based on the technique that you are trying to use. So now we have uh, to, we conducted our analysis. And so we took uh, some project for the, from the defect 4J uh, data set. And then we, we conducted our study on uh, the three techniques that I was mentioning before. So the first one being the mutation testing. So it, here, what we see in mutation testing is that the impact is relatively low. So you see that the mutation score, which is basically the number of tests that are being, uh, uh, the number of kill, uh, mutants that are being killed by your test suite is, uh, uh, increasing, but really, uh, really so slowly and not really dramatically. You see that at the beginning, it's a bit, uh, a bit stronger, but the effect plateau very quickly. On the other hand, if you look at automatic program repair, you see that here we have a catastrophic effect. And uh, if you compare here, the nominal flake rate was moving up to 50%. So that means that 50% of our potentially flaky tests were actually uh, flaking uh, half of the time that they were, they were run. Whereas here at 20%, we see that we can already do not, we cannot uh, deliver any valid patch anymore. So that means that if you have, if you are trying to, um, to, uh, to produce a technique of automatic program repair on a flaky test suite, that uh, you have to really uh, take into account the, the, the stability of your test suite. And finally, we look at fault localization. So fault localization here, what you see in precision is the, the number of Jenny one uh, of Jenny one um, uh, uh, locations that are, have been done and that were actually uh, retained. Whereas here you see the number that are, were actually uh, discovered. And so what you see is that uh, again, the as the nominal flick rate increases, the effect is really dramatic, especially at the for the precision at low at low values. You see really a drop in the ability to actually detect the real uh, the real uh, uh, faulty faulty location, and so here that's my the, that's my uh, last slide. And so just what I wanted to to show with this tool is that uh, as the we have to have uh, ways and means to be able to account for the flakiness that might occur in real world setting. Because what I didn't show you is that in real world setting, unlike in uh, the test that we use for. Uh, experiments, we have a lot of flakiness. And so a technique that might have very good performance in the presence of flakiness might uh, be very disastrous in uh, industrial settings. And that's how I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. And sorry for the little hiccup with the, with the, the presentation. No worries, no worries. No more. We, we could follow the, the slides anyway. So thanks a lot to you. Um, and uh, again, thanks to, to all the speakers of this session. Um, so we, as I said, we're a bit behind the schedule. So, the schedule, so let's uh, dive right directly into the, into the discussion. Um, so if, if there are urgent questions, uh, please ask them. So uh, otherwise I would, start by picking up some of the questions from the chat because i saw that there has been a lot of interest triggered in uh in the code review topics so these questions go particularly to hyun jin and to emma and maybe we can collectively also discuss about them so the first one i would like to pick up is that um is the question by luis um that uh, and he says that he is, he understands that that most of the checks that are uh, in this uh, tests uh, in this um, uh, review automation tool that has been presented by Hyun Jin could also be kind of integrated into a CI CD pipeline, right? Uh, so these are the typical tasks that you would integrate into a CI uh, pipeline. So you could also report them to developers before even asking for a human code review, right? And as a follow-up, he is asking that, um, what are the, well, what are the aspects that should be captured by human reviews and cannot be captured by such a review bot? So maybe this is the, the, the first thing we, we, we can discuss about. And I think, uh, the opinions, especially of, uh, Hyun Jin and, and Emma are, are very helpful in this respect and i found this question very interesting yeah oh 
First of all, basically, quadruple trigger time is same as CI. So, when a develop, develop, request, developer requests a review, as sure he always does, code, such as make a pull request or make a, make a review in a get it, or change it, make a get change it, code report is triggered from, from the request. Then it makes energy, sub, energy request for various energy tools and or services. And finally, it receives their result and writes the Ruby command. So it is similar to CI. But, um, but since because of the separating servers or we use so many Ruby systems, so we have to separate, uh, we, mm, we want to, to unify the DB systems, so we develop our unified system. <laughs> the kind of question is, uh, uh, I think code robot or may, any code robot automation will that detect any the complex logic errors. For example, to detect a specific bug, uh, for, for example, to detect a specific, specific bug, to fix it, uh, it spend much time. Uh, this type, uh, this type's complex error should be fixed by humans, I think. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks. So so what I what I understood uh, and and uh, if I got it correctly is that the it, it's not so much an issue of where in the process, right? You you trigger this uh, uh, this code review automation, and, and I see clearly that there are different uh, yeah, times where you could could trigger this. The the second question, I, I still not have a, a good uh, picture of what should be yeah covered by human review and what can be covered by such a code review automation of course there is an intuition that uh, as soon as it goes into domain semantics and stuff like this i think it's it's hard to do this using code review automation um emma can what, I, can, can, yeah 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 no i was going to jump you, in you, you I, are the expert so i have no idea about code review automation <laughs> Oh, no, well, I've, I've worked quite a bit with this uh, previously yeah. at Google and, and uh, also we studied code review there. So that's why my pointer to the track of the system, it seems like there are some similarities and maybe some interesting things to compare if you, if you haven't. Um, one thing that we definitely discussed in the tracker team once upon a time was this, uh, we were sitting us next to kind of compiler teams and there are these, some things are errors, they should just go into the compiler. So you have this kind of changes as they're being built. So if it's always an error, if the uncertainty is, is low, you can make it really have it really close to the compiler, for instance. While things that would be more warnings, there's more uncertainty, closer to false positive rates goes up. Those kind of fit closer to uh, code review. That was one thing that we were kind of discussing a lot and then gathering user feedback on that. But um, and then one thing we saw as well, I will mention is that uh, as this was integrated to code review, this is the main sort of integration point for this uh, static analysis pipeline. You would see as we studied code review that people would actually start to interact with the bots first and then, you know, because they don't want to bother people. And this is generally something I've seen in other settings as well. Like not, you don't want to bother with people because it's very expensive. So, but getting this first sort of getting it to a state where the bots are happy <laughs> and maybe many mm -hmm. bots and then you can send it for reviews. So I think that's kind of already happening. I don't know to what extent this is what you see at Samsung, but that's definitely. Uh, and then you kind of have that situation a little bit where you're handing over some the simple things to the bots, but they're not always right. So you have to kind of account for that somehow. And then and humans can focus on other things. They can also see what's already kind of covered. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Maybe so while we are discussing about this, so I also would like to pick up another follow up question by Luis. So this was uh, also to you, Emma, like this is where he's talking about this diversity of attention points, whether this is an advantage or disadvantage, right? So having so do you want to really go for like this consistency or is it is it not an advantage to have more diversity here and we have different uh, attention or viewpoints uh, well spontaneously diversity is good uh, mm. and, and i mean having different views and and that's it's just a strength to have people that can see different things and and like 
roughly, that's my answer to that. But there's also, uh, at the same time, code review is this place where people meet. So it's about normatization. You see people kind of learning, getting into the practice, and there's certain expectations on what code looks like in this team and this company and so on. So if you start to kind of put um, the set of anal uh, bots, for instance, if you put them very locally to each person and they start to put a different quality met uh, metrics under code and then they, they can you know you can imagine doing that more locally and then you meet in code review and you have different views on that that can introduce issues of course i don't i see the seeing different things it seems like that doesn't necessarily mean that you have different views on the like what the bots would would say it's more that you uh you know the api the, uh, the guy looking or, or woman looking at sort of api compliance that's just like in more analysis being done by a human and maybe something that a human needs to do. I still think also that there be, could be, by the way, the, the more domain specific analysis, but it's there's a cost in kind of adding more analysis like that, um, going beyond the more general purpose ones. So did that answer the question, Luis? It did. Thank you, you seem to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so so I think it's it's really interesting, right? To and there was another question on this of how interaction between uh, the the review bot uh, and the user should take place. So I think this is really something uh, where we I think we we have an idea, but this uh, this this way of empirical and uh, explorative research here is maybe and do do more user studies on this, right? What helps what helps the users here? How should they interact with these bots? How do they, um, yeah, how they are used most efficiently? That's something quite interesting. Of course, you can always put, try to push the level of automation and put more into the bots. Uh, I think that's 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 one way to go. But at the end, you have to and decide where is the where is the intersection to to. Uh, to interact yeah. with the user. Can I add one one final thing just in relation to sure. For sure. For sure. you you were saying that it doesn't matter maybe where the automation happens. And I, I disagree with that because uh just running an analyzer in, in Jenkins or a CI system like that, and you you have this something that becomes red in code review, this integration is quite common. And you see that something something failed in CI pipeline and you have to move over to this other tool, go through the log, and which is can be a bit tedious. Uh, as opposed to having, you may get some context information in that setting, but having the robot comment, if you will, call them that, in in exactly in the context you have in code review, it's 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 in my view low cost and, and a better place to see it. So it does matter, and I think we should think a lot about kind of where to introduce those kinds of recommendations or um, robot comments. Uh, yeah, well, there are so many servers in uh, for it to use review systems. Mm. Just I say, just three review systems, but GitHub have two servers and purpose Helix Core, uh, Helix Swarm servers uh, about 10 or more servers. So there are so many servers and they have different policies and different CI systems. So it can, um, it can use one unified CI just uh, such as Jenkins or any other CI systems. So we uh, we use uh, we want to make our systems. Okay, so I would propose to to leave uh, the topic of uh, code reviews a bit to also strive the other uh, presentations. So one thing um, that that came up and also is is, is partly reflected uh, in the chat. I think is this relation between ML Lint uh, and uh, ML Smell Hound, and there, you were speaking a lot about this context. So I was wondering actually for the and and the the problem of the of the huge number of false positives of static analysis in, in machine learning uh, code. Um, I'm not an expert in static analysis, but uh, as far as I know, false false positives are a, a very general problem in static analysis, um, not only for machine learning code. So, what what makes this this kind of um, problem specific to to machine learning code, and uh, why is context would context not always be helpful if you speak about static analysis um, and 
That's something I, I was interested in. Yeah. Maybe this, this question goes um, to Jai here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I can uh, target that first part of the question. It's um, uh, the thing about context is that it's not only uh, it's it's a concept. We we're just uh, applying it to static analysis to see if that uh, the reports generated by static analysis can be absorbed by a larger audience. For example. In the data science community, I don't think there is a lot of um, use of static analysis code in doing uh, while writing code. So what happens is that there is uh, inconsistencies. If you have two data scientists like working on a same project, there's inconsistencies amongst them. And plus, you have certain unwritten rules in software engineering where you don't have like magic numbers that are directly declared in, in your code and things like that. Where, which can cause issues or manifest as bigger problems uh, in, in, uh, in, in example, uh, Knight Capital, which was like a financial firm lost about 440 million because there was dead code parts in their algorithm. So these things are not very well known in that data science community. So applying context will one, reduce some of these obvious issues that um, that soft, the software engineering community knows about and allows the data scientists to absorb what static analysis tools report to them as well. Because if you read any uh, report or like any static analysis message, like let it be PyLint, let it be a Java linter, any, you require some degree of software engineering expertise to actually understand that and then use it in your code like okay this this is what the linter is telling me this is what i'm going to do so in the data science community they come from a scientific programming background and i don't think um they the absorption of this message is fully applied in that so that's where the context comes in and allows them to understand that uh, message further uh, while I'm on the topic, I'd also like to touch on one of the questions asked by Renaud, if I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, so in the tool, that was just an example. So we just took, that's only one part of a very minute part of a context that we wanted to check if the thing, if the concept actually works. So hence, we just use the file level input. But in, if we, what we plan on doing is expanding the model of context to include like the problem domain, uh, team norms, uh, the technical domain of machine learning. So these, these will include information that is otherwise gained through experience that we want to model as context and uh, improve the false positive rate in these tools. Does that answer your question? For the most part, yeah, thanks. So uh, maybe I can uh, ask the follow up is, uh, so you are trying to create new, new rule with your context. And uh, so is it a different set of rules or is it just a subset of the rules that you are trying to build? That's the part I was not sure about. No, a different set of rules. And so the current practices that are used in the typical software engineering uh, community, you would you would want not to to bother the data scientists with those because they are too like cons constraining or something like that. That's that's how you envision it. Um, to a degree, yes, to a degree. The reason I say to a degree is, yes, you do want to have consistency in code. So it's understood by everyone. But uh, at the same time, it's difficult to enforce something that is completely new to somebody. So it is important to consider what norms are uh, used in the data science community and include them as part of rules for linters um, as well. That's the general idea. Of. If I may add to that, um, for example, we have a lot of data science projects written in books. Yeah? And uh, for those who uh, know, cost smell analysis is useless because then you can spend a lot of time just improving the code quality of a prototype. But we some of the smells could actually make sense there. So not all the smells about white space or the, the, the variables, but there might be some code smells that are actually useful. So it's important that these static analysis tools are able to pick up these differences in projects. Um, yeah, that was my my uh, two cents. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this. So, so I was just generally wondering about some. It appeared to be that some some of these uh, ideas that 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 I saw are not not entirely specific to to machine learning applications, right? Uh, because uh, to, to kind of make this static analysis tool more domain specific, if you sure. want to generalize about this. Yeah, I yeah. think machine learning is just a really nice example where we can observe these things. But indeed, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. We see these examples in many different domains. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the idea is to make it domain specific, but we're just using machine learning as a test bed. Yeah, it's it's a nice, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a timely uh, application domain. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and it is needed, so hey, why not? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. In that space. sure, sure. It it, it ties into the similar work that uh, Bart is doing uh, with his machine learning smells. It's because we don't know a lot of, about machine learning code smells in that area, so it's it's a important area of research that can mm. improve the entire robustness.